But as welcome to the first show of Ask a Black Dude, uh, where I have conversations with interesting people regarding interesting topics of race, politics, whatever else I can think of. Today we'll be discussing the Down River Bubble. What does that mean? I'll get at, get into that in a second. But first, my guest, Damian Matthews. Mathis Matthews? Who is Damian Matthews? <laughs> <laughs> Damian Matthews. Damian Matthews. Damian Matthews. Damian Matthews. joke in there. <laughs> Uh, Damian Mathis, he is a CMU alum. Uh, he works in a prodigious law firm in Southeastern Michigan. How you doing, brother? Not too bad. How are you? Well, I just messed up your name, so we just got to know about <laughs> All right. We're keeping that one in, too. Uh, <laughs> and joining us is Keith Brown. He is a Cooley Law School uh, graduate, and he works for uh, the courts of law. How you doing, brother? I'm great. Talking to y'all. How are you doing? I'm doing, doing good. Good to see you guys here. So, the Down River Bubble, what is that? Uh, to me, that is a place uh, in southeastern Michigan where everyone is pretty much the same, despite of race, nationality, uh, origin, sex, that economically, uh, financially, they are kind of on the same space. Uh, the problem with that is the advantages and the privileges that one part, the majority, uh, does have in other parts of society. The line is so thin that it's almost non-existent, but yet it is. And the problem is, is because it's so small, the majority think it's not real. So today we're going to be discussing uh, how we saw it, how we see it, and what we can do to fix it, or if we can fix it. So first, uh, we all came from different backgrounds. I came from Detroit when I was like eight or nine years old. Uh, Keith came from Lincoln Park. Damon came from Wyandotte. So uh, first, Keith, uh, when you came from Lincoln Park, uh, did you notice anything different when you were come from that location when you settled in Taylor? I remember vaguely. I think I was eight as well. Um, one year in Lincoln Park, I had one black student in my class, I believe. Um, and then obviously to Taylor, it's different. Um, not at first, but gradually, you know, especially in high school, big difference. Um, Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting because I, I think I remember you when you, you moved. And this was Lincoln Park before Lincoln Park became Southwest Detroit. Well, you know, it, you bring up an entry point. Yeah, you bring up an entry point that uh, I definitely want to I want to hit at after we get Damien's thoughts. He's coming from from one. Like, he was young, too. We were all very young when we moved from where we were from to, to eventually Taylor, Michigan. And I was just very curious to see, even at that young age, if we noticed something was different. So, Damien, I know you came from Wanda. Did you notice anything, any changes or anything like that? Definitely in like the neighborhood wise, uh, where I came from in Wyandotte, I don't really remember the, the move itself, but I still had family in that same neighborhood in Wyandotte. So over the time I kind of got to know the neighborhood and it's very white, very white based neighborhood, uh, as a whole and coming to Taylor, we had in my neighborhood, uh, e-course road, opposite side of e-course, you had more the, uh, more kind of segregated type of neighborhood. My neighborhood was real white. And then the opposite side of my neighborhood is when you started getting into like the apartment complexes. And that of course was mm -hmm. your more of your, your black community was over in that area. And like Keith had pointed out earlier, you don't, I didn't really recognize a big difference until it was about high school. Mm -hmm. um, and we could probably get into that a little later, but Taylor's two high schools that when we were still going and our high school, we had, you know, black students in our school, but nothing compared to Truman High School, which was predominantly where the black community went. Um, so that's where it really started to see that the difference. And a lot of that came to the housing location. Yeah, it's, you know, you, you mentioned housing. When I came from Detroit, I mean, there's a community, uh, for those who are watching, we're not from Michigan, not from the South. Uh, Eastern Detroit area, this area that we call it Pickwick. Pickwick was one of those uh, community bases, townhouse uh, bases where it was affordable living. And and what you saw was when I moved into Pickwick, it was a lot more kind of 70, 30, you know, Caucasian to, to non. And then slowly over time, due yeah. through government programming, accessibility, Pickwick and others throughout the Taylor became more um, diverse and then ultimately became more African-American. Compared to, uh, and I could, when you say affordable, do you mean Section Eight? I do mean Section Eight. I do mean Section Eight, uh, and uh, and others, 
uh, as well. Um, that allowed people to move from Detroit, move from different areas into Taylor to do like what my parents wanted from me. You know, they wanted me to get out of that Detroit situation and try to have a better uh, education and better life there. So when you guys move here, and I, I was always curious of this, you know, with, with the way things are, uh, parents having to teach their kids how, how to handle uh, diversity and minority uh, situations and stuff, or how to interact, you know, what were your guys' Uh oh! Don't do that, camera. Don't do that. Okay. What were your What were your guys' um, you know lessons? You know, did they have any conversations with you about you know interactions or anything like that? What to say? What not to say? I'm I'm very curious about that. Uh, Damien, you can go first. Yeah, I'll start. Time. I'll start with this one. So my both of my families, both my mother's side and father's side, both come from the middle of you know Kentucky the middle of Tennessee to where there, there is no African-American, there is no minorities in their communities. But that being said, a, their, a lot of their communities are very low end in terms of finances and things. So you're mm -hmm. talking a trailer park in the middle of the holler, you know, between two mountains and you just put a trailer there and well, that's your home. So I was less taught, uh, well, both came to Michigan obviously for automotive jobs and things like that. And um, growing up, I was taught less the, the, the diversity aspect, minorities aspect, and more on the um, kind of like your means, mm -hmm. you know? So that's where it was, you know, always, always show respect towards anybody because we came from nothing mm -hmm. kind of a thing. We came from the low, you know, low end of the totem pole. So you kind of always want to treat people that way. And then there really wasn't much of a, of a race conversation. So, you know, that, that, that's very interesting because, you know, I think there's definitely, at, at least as generations going on, you know, back in the day, those who were in your, your grandparents situation, parents situation that were poor, they still would segregate themselves from the other poor blacks. <laughs> they still thought themselves better. So it, it, it's definitely um, interesting that when they were raising you or brought, you know, brought you up, they're like, hey, you know, we can't, like you said, we came from nothing. We had to pull ourselves from our bootstrap. So it was, don't it think was very, yourself. Yeah, it became very class-based, less race-based, you know, teaching. Yeah, so. very, very. Keith, go ahead. No, a very similar experience. So, I mean, for me, I mean, Lincoln Park to Taylor at the time was – Maybe it still is today, maybe it's not, but it was a very lateral move, right? Um, we were just upsizing. Uh, my brother was born, um, and we just switched cities. My mom grew up in Taylor, went to Truman for when it opened. Um, so it was, you know, it was, again, it was just it was the auto workers everywhere in both towns. It's just kind of what I knew is the auto workers culture. Everybody was blue collar. Um, I do remember, like, I, I said on Lincoln Park, I had uh, one black person in my class, I think I remember, um, and I remember saying something about it, like it was an odd memory, but I remember saying something about it at home, and my mom said, it doesn't matter how people are people. I said, oh, okay, all right, <laughs> all right. I'm five, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then somewhere along the line, very quickly, you know, when we were in fourth grade, and met you and everyone else. Um, moved along, but again, it was all it was all class based. Um, we were all in the auto worker culture together. Um, it was kind of a us versus more of the rich people, more than it was anything about race, right? Like, um, you know, and even you know, and, and Taylor is not just black and white, right? I think we, mm. we just kind of that is there's a large Asian population, there's a large Indian population, large Filipino population, um, some Eastern Europeans, um, Hispanic cultures growing, you know, stuff like that. But again, it was all, and back then it was still, you know, this was still in the 90s, late 90s, everybody still worked like our governors. Right. Yeah. Not like it was today, um, where the numbers dwindled, they've all retired or been laid off. Um, everybody still worked for Ford GM or Chrysler or mm -hmm. their fathers did, their grandfathers did. Sometimes their moms did, their aunts and uncles did, or you worked the restaurant serving auto workers, and it's just 
that was, that was the world, right? And it, was, and it was us. It was it was the line workers versus the the suits more than, than it was black versus white or brown. And that that was a point you were saying, like the auto workers. So my grandfather, um, on my mother's side, he was working in the uh, Rue steel plant. You know, and his was less. I mean, he worked with all kinds of, you know, races on, on, on the floor, but it was more or less who worked hard. You know, it was less what you looked like, but how hard you worked. Because at the end of the day, how hard you work is how hard I have to work. So it just became more class. And, they're, and they are all making the same amount of money. So it is that whole automotive blue collar. We, we stick together against as you said, you know, the upper class, the suits. Yeah, I mean, you think you get the point was everybody was a UAW. Everybody made the same amount of money. Well, um, well do you guys think that's, that that was unique uh, in our situation? Because I, I feel like you can take that to like a Gary, Indiana, for example, or, or different parts of the country where you have all the races or most of the races are the same. Uh, mm -hmm. Like say job-wise, like Flint, for example, like, hey, we're all kind of the same, but you don't get that cohesiveness of hey i don't have time to hate you for your for your race i don't have time to hate you for your color i gotta make a check to feed my babies at home so right. if you can if you can do your job i don't care if you're as yeah. a lot of people say black white green whatever if you can do your job to help me get home and take care of my family then i don't care but do you guys believe that that's just unique to our situation coming together or or is that more prevalent um throughout throughout the country as our generation was coming up. So like you said, Keith, you know, late nineties and two thousands, you know, is that more prevalent throughout the country than what we realized or was that situation kind of unique? You know, that's a really good question. I, <laughs> it, it's hard. That's what I'm here for, baby. The good hard questions. That's what I'm here for. That is a very good question. You know, and maybe this requires more thought, you know, and, if you study the history of the UAW and the Teamsters and, and all of the unions and everything, they have terrible racist pasts, you know, even within Wayne County, um, between white plants and black plants in the city and in the suburbs. But, you know, the culture and the 90s, you know, about, you know, like, as long as everybody's on the same side of the picket line, it's all that matters. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and we all make the same much, the same amount, and more of an us versus uh, outsiders thing that's not you know but i don't want to say it's less than the why does he make one of 15 dollars an hour when i don't make 15 dollars an hour or i make 15 dollars an hour why should he get it you know there's less of that but it's definitely still there you, you i mean you see that on facebook from down river people all the time right like i make 16 dollars an hour why should they make 14 dollars 15 mm -hmm. an hour is that the right argument? My personal opinion, no, but it's there, right? Maybe it's mm -hmm. less. Um, there, there, there is more solidarity on that end, I think, than in a lot of communities that I've lived in since. But. David, do you have thoughts on that? So you were, you might have hopped in there. <laughs> I, I, my biggest thing is like the class base because we, but, but I think that is automotive type of company you know selective mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of that is our grandfather's age selective because you know it so much has changed since even then um at that point in time i think it was you know like you said as long as we're on the same side of that picket line then we're on the same team whereas i don't i don't know if that's still the same as it is today but I don't have anybody currently still in that same type of atmosphere. All of them, everyone that I've had is, is, is you know, already come, gone, and retired. Right, right. To to see if, if we're still, you know, if we're still on the same lines of like Keith, like you say, it's it's us versus them, the blue collars versus the suits, you know, and, and you know your your parents, your grandparents, you know, did all those things to put you guys in a position where you could go to college and go to school, so you didn't have to do what they did. Um, you know, Damien, you went to Central Michigan in Mount Pleasant. Keith, you went to the Grand Rapids, uh, to Grand Valley State. 
uh, D was it D two? Are they D two school? That should be the D one because they're because they're. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Whooping them, little 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 private schools as well. <laughs> <laughs> so once you guys left uh, the down quote unquote down river bubble again, the, an area of southeastern Michigan where you know no matter of race class whatever the perception is that we were all the same, we were all equal, the, the illusion of it, as you will, was still in place. Once you guys left and you went to, you know, Mount Pleasant respectively, Grand Rapids respectively, you know, what was the uh, situation? Like, did you walk in and say, oh, this is not, this is, we're not Kansas anymore, as uh, as Dorothy said to, to little Toto. Okay, so I'll go ahead on this one. So Mount Pleasant, uh, well, I should say Central Michigan University as a whole, uh, in the middle of Mount Pleasant. So Mount Pleasant is basically just one giant cornfield. <laughs> and then you take a university and you just start right down in the middle. And, you know, every time the school year starts up, the population of Mount, you know, Mount Pleasant triples, if not quadruples, mm -hmm. simply because school's in session. So that being said, the community is very white. I, you know, it, it, it is mm -hmm. what it is. You know, Mount Pleasant, Claire. That whole area around there, it's white farmers. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of the things we would do sometimes is to get out of the hustle and bustle. Sometimes that is Mount Pleasant bar scenes and stuff. We would go to Claire and, excuse me, go to these little towny bars, as we would call them. And if we had anybody of color or any kind of other race that came with us, it was always that head turner. You know, it's kind of like you, you see them come in. You're kind of like, Ooh, what? Well, how, and, how did and you that, get in here? How did and, you and get that, in right. here? And that, and that brings you back to the question you had asked, you know, of like, you know, you just have you seen anybody like that before? You know, they just seemed real like, like you said, how did they get in here? And yeah. I just well, like that initial uncomfortable feeling. Um, but again, that's the outskirts. Mm -hmm. The actual university as itself. Uh, I mean, we are Central Central Michigan is a very athletic based uh, university. We are a D one school, but we hold our own when it comes to the MAC conference and, and and things like that. And we have a lot of athletes. Large majority of our of our athletes are of African American descent. I mean, our football team, you know, minus JJ Watt when he left <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> the other cornfields. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's so a lot of a lot of the a lot of the you know minorities that we saw on campus you could almost assume were in one way or another affiliated with some kind of a sports team you know it's funny you, the, the story that you mentioned reminds me of the scene I remember the titans right where they walk in with sunshine and sunshine's trying to bring them into the bar and they're like mm -mm, we can't go in here so like, what's wrong why can't we go in they're like no we can't do this sunshine and they go in the music stops it, it feels like your story reminded yeah. me of that situation because that right, is, yeah because it, yeah, because and that's a and that's that thing is you know if you were to take that football team and they were to get up and and go to you know the outskirts bars, it would definitely be that scene. Well, so the question before we get to you, Keith, real quick. So the the question I would ask is because you mentioned the football the football team specifically, and we see this a lot in like examples of Louisiana for a good example, right? Where if you look like you were on the football team or you look like you were on the basketball team. You didn't have a lot of issues, but if you were just random black person <laughs> hanging out in the outskirts, that's where you kind of had the problems with. So it, it, it shows, I guess, or gives the illusion of coherency, or maybe it just bears naked the truth of, hey, you know, while we want to increase diversity, we definitely want the, the areas around to be more accepting, more tolerant. Hey, as of right now, going to the next future, your best bet to not get messed with is be able to catch a football. <laughs> right. um, you know, but speak, speaking of that football team that keeps beating on people, Brian Kelly's favorite school, Keith Grand Rapids, West Side of State, bleeding red over there. Come on now, I know, I know, I know you got, <laughs> I know that to be eye opener for you. Well, I, I'll say this: the first time, the the culture shock between Southeast Michigan and West Michigan hits quick, um, you know, it, growing up in Metro Detroit, thinking that Detroit is what a big city is. Mm -hmm. you know, Detroit of the 90s, right? Like, 
not even Detroit of today. Um, pre Dan Gilbert, pre Mike Gillage mm-hmm. buying half of downtown, pre Slows Barbecue, you know, the old Tiger Stadium is in, right? Mm-hmm. And you went down to your Tiger game, you parked a couple blocks from the stadium, you went in, you walked out, you went home. And you walked quite fast, you know, even with you, we're driving the car, you're locking the doors, <laughs> right? In Grand Rapids, you, if the, after the sun goes down and you're strolling through downtown on the sidewalk and you see these two elderly, you know, this elderly Caucasian couple just walking slowly, holding hands, walking down the street, and you're like... <laughs> what you is got this? Care in the world. What is going on? It's a it's an eye opener, um, you know. And Damien said, you know, Central Michigan is a cornfield with a university popped into it. Uh, Grand Valley is a cornfield in the most conservative county in Michigan. It's basically, I mean, it's the Bible Belt. It's it, it, I mean, it, politics are probably to the right of Alabama, <laughs> and you know the. And Allendale, you know, I mean, Allendale has a fight this year about a Confederate statue. This is the spot where, and it's just, here's the Grand River. It turns, there's a hill, the river's in a valley, and there's a, there's a plateau, and then they plopped a school on it. Uh, paid for mostly by the DeVosses and their other friends in, in Grand Rapids. And if you aren't an athlete, you, and you're black, you probably don't go to Grand Valley. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's it. I mean, we had, there was two other um, African-American students from Taylor when we, when I went there that went out over there with me. And I specifically remember I had to go to diversity class and I actually had to send him a message one day and goes, no, actually this time it's because you're black. <laughs> <laughs> Do an interview with, an, with a, someone of a different background. And I knew one. It was it. I happened to know one. I got lucky. <laughs> um, you, these most well, a lot of students come from Ottawa County and from the Grand Rapids area and um, I think you're going to get to this later but I would probably say 80% of them had never seen a minority and they had it was the one person in the room or there was one black family in the neighborhood or at their school um even big high schools have, I can count on two, you know, I, I taught, when I was a teacher, I taught in every, almost every district in Kenton, Ottawa County. We can, a lot of those big schools, we can count on one or two hands, every black student, every minority student, even. Um, and there are small pockets of heavily diverse schools and small pocket of minority, majority schools. And the rest of them are 99 percent plus Caucasian um, and you get those kids from you know mid northern Michigan from small towns and or, or from the south by the Indiana border and stuff they've seen more Amish than they've seen um, African Americans or Latinos or uh, it, it's crazy now, is that-, that that to me and I know you're gonna you get to this but your point is what's the down river bubble that to me was the down river bubble was it's normal to see different races every day and in most of the world that's not true yeah i mean that's i mean you hit the nail on the head with that one i mean you you talk about a world where you know in, in taylor and our down river area but you know you had a class where you had you know six seven eight out of class of 30 you maybe had you know 10 12 were not white were of different backgrounds races i mean just in 2010 uh did a little little research on this you know wayne county 2010 52 percent of the demographics in wayne county was white 40 percent were black i mean that's a huge number when you and now of course this takes into account detroit but right. that's that's still a huge number when you think about it i mean and as an example jackson mississippi mississippi is 36 percent black yet they always vote red because Right. All the white people. Ninety <laughs> percent of Caucasians vote red. Right. So, a, a side question I have with that though, because you, you bring up a, a point, is the problem that 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 has is that 
geography based where hey if they don't go to a bigger school they'll never see a black person or is that class based i guess what i'm asking is is that is that just um segregation on a different level like hey it's not on purpose but it is on purpose that that it, it happened that way or that it's still happening that way so, it's so i just actually looked up the top the um ethnic diversity of an undergraduate student at central michigan right now it's 77.2 percent white 8.4 percent african-american now central michigan is a university we're a D1 university, but we're not that large. When you're put mm -hmm. in perspective of, you know, U of M, and you put into, you know, Michigan State or, you know, outside of that. Mm -hmm. So we are a middle tier size school, and yet we still have a huge population, you know, white population opposed to any other, you know, so, you know, it's. It's, it's tough to pin down in, in this right. one recording of, of why why those things are the way they are. Um, and we're definitely going to have more conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here for the long call. We're going to have more, more talks about that. But, I mean, you mentioned those numbers. So, I mean, that definitely leads to the next question is, you know, did you, I mean, I guess I, the answer would be yes. But, uh, you know, when you met those who had never met someone of a person of color, you know, I, I guess what was your reaction to to their reaction or what was your, your mindset when certain things happened? You looked at them, they're like, you know, you never met a black person before, huh? <laughs> well, I, I, just because I've experienced this so many times, you know, this, well, we haven't got there, but I experienced this in law school too. What just, you know, um, it, Cooley Law School is actually extremely diverse, except in Grand Rapids. Um, it's just pure obliviousness. Like they go on the day and they just someone just says something and it just makes you stop and you're like, what? <laughs> Did, huh? Like that obliviousness because they have no clue. They have no clue. Yeah, you can tell they've never like they have no idea what they. It's not. It's not cruel. It's not mean. It's not ill intentioned. They just have no idea. They've never actually sat down and had a conversation with uh, a black person before, and and I, I was I, I had a friend in law school, um, African American student. Her family's from Africa. Um, her dad passed when we were in law school, and she actually went to uh, they had a ceremony in Africa, and she amazing person. I mean, amazing attorney. And it just, some people sometimes, our classmates would say something. And I just, <laughs> and I look at her and she, she look, and we just look at each other and go, I, I, I don't know what to say. And I'm looking at her and go, I'm so sorry. Like, and it, it, wasn't, <laughs> and it wasn't that yeah. the, the Caucasian student meant anything by it. They just had no clue what they were saying. Right. Right. And it, just, it was just, um, it's not an intention. It's just, Lack of knowledge. Yeah, just total like unawareness of what's going on around them. Um, you see it in my mom works in Holland, in Ottawa County, and Holland is <laughs> half like Holland is with tulip time is right the Dutch tradition, the wooden shoes, right? They mm -hmm. they still get a half day in Holland in West Ottawa schools for tulip time to go watching the fest in the parade, and the marching band <laughs> still wears little wooden shoes. 50% of half of the West Ottawa schools are either Asian or Hispanic. Right? Really? But, but, and, and, and Holland Public Schools is, uh, has a large black population. But a large part of the Caucasian population in Holland has no idea. <laughs> Seriously. If you live on the wrong side of the bay, you yeah. don't know. You don't know. They have no idea. We're, yeah, which is crazy they, they, people the sh and and you talking about the down river bubble and you know if you've never left it you would have the same perspective right like mm -hmm. it's the way it is we all live together in this pot right mm -hmm. people in these communities that don't go more than two or three miles from their house have no idea about that world 
Yeah, I think that's where it benefits. Other people live differently. Yeah, that's where the benefit of, of where you guys left, went to college, and, and I had, you know, my life experiences where I kind of traveled with my father, uh, where we could see the different aspects of the world and see different uh, situations where you're like, you know, where I'm at, where I'm growing up at is, even if it's an illusion, it's an illusion of uniqueness, you know what I'm saying? But you you, you bring up a point, Keith, and I'm very interested of the answer that you guys have to this this is not a, this is a question i really just thought of these are the, the best times that i have and stuff is so take that person right that caucasian person keith that you mentioned and i know damien you probably have a couple on top of your head uh they just don't know right they don't know what they don't know whose job is that to educate that person is it my job as african-american or a person of color to pull that person aside and say hey you don't say these things, you don't do these things, or am I able to say, hey, it's 2021. There is no more excuse for you not to know what you can and cannot say. I have to learn about your history forcibly through schooling and whatnot. There's no reason why you can't take five minutes to figure it out, to figure out what to say, what not to say. So, so the question is, is that whose job is that to educate that person, if it's someone's job at all? <laughs> well, you bring up good yeah, that's right. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's right. That's what I'm here for. Oh, okay. So let's let's flip this. Okay, and we'll, let's put aside the state of civics education and American history education. As a former civics and American history teacher, I'm gonna leave that to the side. But let's go back to the summer, right? From your perspective, so George Floyd's killed. Mm -hmm. Everything else that went on this summer. How many times did you ask, get asked, hey, what can I do? What should I do? What is okay? And was that exhausting for you? I got asked it a bit. Um, it was only exhausting to me because I, my fear was that it was insincere. Not okay, insincere. So, so do you want those questions? Do you feel like they're sexier most of the time? Do you feel like people are just asking because? So, you know, like so you, you what, what, so what you ask is it, it has a theory. I have a theory that there's three types of person of color, at least two types of black person, right? There's a black person that is here to help. You ask me the question, I'll give you the answers. I will walk you through it, you know, no matter what it is, as long as I know you're sincere, you're trying to learn. And I can pre, I can pretty quickly figure out if you're just mockery or if you're actually trying to learn, right? Then there's second black person who says, no, nah, F you, get out of my face, you can figure it out. Like, I don't care. You can figure it out. 2021, do the research, figure it out. And then there's third black person who has helped but been burnt so many times that they just stop caring and they get desensitized to it. And these stages are not concrete these say the people flow in and out of these stages i have flown in in and out of these stages throughout my life the only reason why i'm here now is because i'm for some reason flown into stage one where i'm like yeah sure let's talk about it let's help right but to answer your to answer your question you know if someone were to sincerely say hey i don't know help me better understand your world and, and my world and how it comes together then yeah i will walk you through it in answers that i don't know I will try to find out, like example, the N word that we had before, you know, we start recording this. But if it's a situation where like last summer you mentioned that I just feel it's, like it's a flavor of the week, like, all right, we're all, cause Corona, we're all inside. Everyone was bored. We felt, found a reason to go outside. Like it was the first time I seen racism lose to a virus. Like I'd never seen racism <laughs> lose to a virus before, right? Racism didn't beat, didn't lose the Spanish flu. So racism, you know, you know what I mean? Polio didn't beat racism, you know, racism was still rampant. That was the first time I've seen racism, uh, uh, racism take an L like that. Cause Corona was like, no, we need, we need to go outside. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but I thought the, the insincerity of it came, um, because of boredom. The problem that I was asked about was, Hey, I, a white person want to help. Like you say, I want to do something, but every time I go and try to help, said black group gets mad at me said black group doesn't want me there why would they try to deny my help and my response to those people would be so take blm for example last year's you know margins of protest 
when you're that angry and you're the angry mob, they're not tr- they're not looking at you as an individual and saying, "Hey, individual white person, you're trying to help." Their mindset is, "White cop killed someone that looks like me." So if you're a white person, I'm you're the enemy. Right, wrong, or indifferent. That's how the mob thinks, right? That's how the mob works. And my mob mentality. It is that, for lack of a better word, that is that mob mentality, right? It's anger and not reason. It's anger and not reason. Now, what I would tell Caucasian person is, while you want to help uh, go down and protest do those things, what I would tell Caucasian is, hey, go to your neighborhoods. Go to your friends. Go to your family. Go to those people that you know have... Uh, mindsets and insights that are counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. Go to your communities and say, hey, can we maybe be nicer to the Black people, please? Like, that will benefit the circle as a whole than you, than us trying to recreate the March on Selma with Martin Luther King that we always try to do. I had, I had 